Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Patterson. And I'm Ryan Hill. We have Jim Gedoldick, cinematographer and VR specialist, joining us today to discuss the ever-evolving world of immersive video. Hi, Jim. Hey, guys. Hey, gals. <laughs> so, Jim, from an early age, you seem to be on a pretty clear trajectory toward a career in not just video, but immersive video. How did you get started? Ah, uh, so you're taking me back here. Um, getting started would have obviously been through um, skateboarding and snowboarding. Um, and seeing a lot of what skateboarders and snowboarders do as they're, you know, getting deeper into, into those worlds is watching lots and lots of, uh, videos, skate videos and snowboard videos, you know, uh, people coin the term with action sports, uh, kind of falls under the umbrella of people doing, um, some crazy things. Usual thing would be you go down to the local skate shop, you you watch a video there, you pick up a video. A lot of the companies, um, when I started skating, you know, had team videos at this time. You know, companies out there like Powell Perolta and New Deal and Plan B, tons and tons of others um, would have these videos out there. And that would be, you know, every skate kid's calling to what the pros were doing, what was happening in you know, the Mecca, California, that was for, you know, the hub of, of skateboarding and seeing a lot of the videos at this time were kind of all over the place. Um, you know, it was, it was basically friends filming friends, uh, deck to deck, or this is pre final cut, uh, to, to date myself of, uh, when I started skating and, um, you know, as a kid, editorial and production and cinematography, I had no had no clue other than what I saw as a kid going to Hollywood, you know, to a movie theater and seeing Star Wars, E.T., you know, Goonies, all of that and just being enamored with the story and not so much technically knowing how everything was getting done, but being really interested in that. You know, skateboarding really kicked it off for me to start paying attention because what you want to do is you want to emulate the tricks that you see, the, um, you know, the vibe, the style, everything that was captured in those earlier days of, of, uh, you know, skate culture in the magazines and in videos. Skateboarding as a start in cinematography is not uncommon, especially for a lot of, uh, younger cinematographers. Uh, Spike Jones comes to mind. I think he started as a skateboarding videographer. And it's it's really common, especially in the music video industry. What about that aesthetic or background do you think informs what you do today? I think it has a huge impact because uh, anytime somebody asks me how I've gotten into the industry and doing what I do today, I always turn back to skateboarding. I think the the mentality and the culture, everything that's wrapped around skateboarding as a whole encompasses, you know, thinking outside the box. <laughs> um, uh, like you said, there's a lot of current uh, DPs and cinematographers and directors, uh, producers um, that cross a lot of different fields from features to music videos to experiential. And uh, it kind of gives you a different view on life in general, but just coming at things differently. Because when you're trying a trick for, you know, hours a day, days, and then weeks at a time, you know, sometimes it takes a while to, to learn tricks. Kids learn tricks a lot faster, I would say, from when, uh, when I started skating, the level of progression has come up a lot. I would say that level of progression also has come over to the creative side of things because things are more accessible today. You see a, a very uh, quick progression for people in the film industry, music industry. We have a lot of tools now that um, you know weren't available even 10 years ago that help accelerate people's path or their careers in either skateboarding or in, in filmmaking these days. 
And you're pretty much self-taught, is that correct? Yeah, I didn't. I did not go to film school. Uh, after graduated high school, I was chasing the whole uh, pro thing myself and skateboarding, and snowboarding, and traveling and competing. And did about a year of college in Vermont, and just was more into learning about filmmaking and just wanting to skate and, and snowboard all the time. So I probably didn't pay much as much of attention. Um, as I would have liked to. I went to film school and I think you made the right call. I think you, <laughs> you're on the right track. <laughs> I, I Look, second I, that. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, I think I, and I've been asked that many times about, you know, do you need to go to film school um, I or college in general? And I say education is, is super important. I think that I'm trying to educate myself every day into different things because those being informed like that is going to definitely have an effect on, uh, you know, my creativity and the informed decisions that I make, whether it be on set or it's, you know, in a piece of software of, of how I'm approaching things. And that, that influence uh, circle that you would have at film school is, is probably one of the coolest things that you can have is you have all these talented people together in one area. And all you have to focus on is, learning and creating stories that works nicely with my next question which is like you said formal education probably not the most important thing in the world but learning constantly and expanding your skill set wherever that happens is super important you've worked in a lot of different fields and learning new skills seems to be a, a large portion of how you've become successful how do you think you balance the need for expertise with the need to sort of constantly expand your skill set yeah, and this is kind of like the jack of all trades question. Yeah. <laughs> which is which is it's always hard because I I hate titles. You know, like obviously you you pick a focus everybody, you know, in in Hollywood or what are you? What do you do? You know, it's like the biggest question you have when you go to a party you meet someone is what do you do for work? And it's you know, like you mentioned, I've had my hands in a lot of things over the years, and I think it's from always wanting to experiment. If you're a director, DP, or, or EP, and you're at a higher level, when you've also been able to be in the shoes of other positions, it gives you a, a better respect for the team that you work with to understand that everybody is contributing to the end goal, which is getting the story out there, making sure that you're kind of delivering on the vision of the team. In my area and where I like to kind of sit, I do like to be informed of and try different things. So I think that's why not not sitting still and you know going from something that I'd be working on with friends at a skate brand to the next thing I'm working on a car commercial or I'm working on, you know, some kind of experiential augmented reality or virtual reality experience. I think it's just my brain not wanting to sit still and and be okay with just working in like one path or one vertical. It just I got to mix it up and I think that goes back to skateboarding. If you're skating and you're skating in the street, like it's basically an all out assault on everything that is in front of you. And, and it's just a self-expression. And I think that same thing comes over to storytelling and filmmaking and art and music. They all come together to make, you know, an, an end piece, at, whether in that end piece is a commercial or it's a art exhibit or a VR uh, game or a VR experience. It just it kind of encompasses everything. I think a lot of people tend to use the word VR as a blanket term for kind of all immersive video, but there's distinctly different types of content. Could you give us an overview of these different mediums and the ways they're currently being used? Yeah, um, it is used quite a bit. And I think that's to the benefit of media and, and PR being able to blanket it um, under one umbrella, you know, we have virtual reality, we have augmented reality, we have mixed reality, which is XR. It's a lot of buzzwords. And the buzzwords, I think, are used to either market a product or market uh, a game or an experience. So, you know, some purists will say that uh, 360 video is not VR because it doesn't have depth or it is 
a three doff, which is a three degrees of freedom, basically your head movement that we would see from some of the earlier uh, head mounted devices that you would have is that you would only have certain degrees of freedom of of head movement or locomotion with your body uh, versus a six doff, which is six degrees of freedom, where you would have a lot more liberation to move around an environment. And that's why we see a lot of these different pieces of technologies that have been cropping up, you know, over the past uh, five, six years. So with with VR, what a lot of people think of right away with VR is putting on a big bulky headset onto your face and then you're transported away to some beautiful environment in Hawaii or to a game. It's just a different ecosystem and a different language. The main differences in VR, you're usually using one of the top three or four headsets that are out there, you know, Oculus Rift or an Oculus Quest, an HTC Vive or HTC Cosmos, uh, Valve Index. And that's usually where you're putting on a headset and the environment around you is inclusive into the headset. So, You're either tethered to a large computer with a a big CPU and GPU load that can process the games in base 60 frames per second, and you're, you're basically inside that environment. It's in the headset. With augmented reality, think of it more as you're having a layer over your real world environment. And a lot of this we've seen in sci fi films for years and years. And with AR, we think of more minority report where, you know, Tom Cruise is, you know, uh, wearing like haptic gloves that are interfacing uh, with a, a gooey screen that is all haptic and touch based where that that layer is over the real world environment. So in augmented reality uh, headsets, if you will, they're not really headsets, but they're viewing devices. You've got Magic Leap, you've got HoloLens, you've got a lot of these other devices that are that are out there that basically you can see your real world environment in front of you. You can see your laptop, you can see the, you know, the street corner, the sign, all that. And then there's a layer of information or experience on top of that. So it's, it's really uh, different technologies in different languages explaining a whole lot that's going on in these environments. And, you know, when you talk about the use cases, it's far beyond just entertainment. It's just another set of tools that its story is evolving day by day just because the technology is evolving so quick. So I think that's why people are a little confused as to like, what is VR? What is AR? What is mixed reality? There's a lot of uh, nomenclature that's being thrown out into the world of what this thing is. And I think it's still a bit early to call it one thing and say it is this is it definitively. Right, right. And it gets even more jumbled because, especially in your case, they're often used in combination. VR, AR, photogrammetry, these things are different but not mutually exclusive. Uh, So you're you're often mixing these mediums in a single project, right? Yeah. um, You know, you'll shoot – if you're shooting VFX plates – a lot of time in plate photography for you know visual effects, you're shooting multi-camera arrays. Good case study for that is uh, you know Oblivion with Joe Kaczynski. Shooting the back plates was a multi-red camera shoot. I believe at that time it was uh, uh, Red Dragons that were in a linear hyper rig. So it had basically multiple uh, Red Dragons that were using a wider lens and shooting the backplates for some of those sunsets and and uh scenes in there and then you're you're stitching those together to get a backplate for the rear projection uh that they were doing on oblivion um that's been that kind of um rear projection technique has been used for a long time so is front projection um now we're moving obviously into augmented reality and using screens within that but mixing these different technologies yields a lot of opportunity for either experimenting or for different approaches to storytelling. Sometimes you can use this tech to reduce the visual effects on the back end in post because you're shooting real-time lighting environments um, for car commercials. So and if you don't have the budget to go to Hawaii to shoot 
if you happen to source the footage and you're using, you know, rear projection, front projection, or you happen to, to create that environment in a game engine, you could basically do your playback on set through a projector, through, you know, screens or, or a large grid and have that content played back. So your, your actors or your subject is experiencing that or reacting with it in real time. And then you're getting that same desired effect that you would have um, potentially if you're shooting on location. Getting into VR cinematography a little bit more specifically, um, I think a lot of people tend to go wrong because they are afraid it's going to be different from traditional cinematography. Uh, how do you approach a VR production differently than a more traditional one? Um, there's same similar assets uh, that you're going to be capturing and, and definitely certain methodologies that, that you would you would use in that you're still going to have a grip and a gaffer and, and the lighting. So you may have the same players on a production or on set. Um, and sometimes it could be two people. It, it's really, you know, what the idea is and how, how much you need to scale it. It, it starts backwards. It really does. Um, if you look at uh, shooting live action uh, VR, you're looking at, are you shooting it 360? Are you shooting it 180? Is it mono or is it stereoscopic? There's some of these things that you go into it, like within your pre-production, and you're saying, is this destined for uh, a headset or a, a particular platform? Those are going to have ripple effects down through your production choices. That being said, there are a couple different ways that you can tackle how you would approach a live action VR uh, project and one of them is is definitely looking at what your project is. Are you doing a narrative? Are you doing a comedy? Are you doing a documentary style? Because um, the big thing that we have to 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 look at is if you're shooting 360, everything is in the shot. The crew can be in the shot. The gripping equipment can be in the shot. So there's nowhere really to hide in, in 360 unless you're creating a prop or like many of us have done, um, you're running behind something and hiding <laughs> and you're remotely, potentially, depending on the camera system, you're remotely triggering um, the camera and and scuttling off uh, somewhere on set or somewhere uh, off in the distance to hide. Um, looking at the barrier to entry, I think the camera systems intimidate people because it's it's multi-sensor, it's, it's multiple uh, micro SDs or SD cards. If you're doing a multi-camera red particular project, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, quite a lot larger media pipeline than you would be as if, if say, you were shooting with like a, a GoPro Fusion or an Insta360 uh, One X, which is much more manageable. And I think some of those cameras, like the Insta360 or GoPro, obviously GoPro just dropped a, a new camera too for 360 for VR. And you've got a, an easier barrier to entry with renting or using a camera or having a camera like that on set or with you to just experiment with. One thing that I do with um, the smaller form factor cameras, like the, you know, the One X or, or the Fusion is um, I always keep those in my bag as a scout tool. Cause this way, if you shoot a 360 image and you bring that, uh, you use any of the iOS or Android apps that they have and you flatten that out into almost a, a panoramic view um, marking up in a 360 environment or marking up just in a what would people would know as like a 2D panel um, is a great way to sketch out where things will will be. Even if you may not be shooting VR, you could still use 360 captured images, uh, whether it be you know a movie file or a still image, and be able to use that as a previs or a scouting tool. Huh. I, I I never considered that. So uh, to get into a little bit more detail about that, you're saying you you're taking either a 360 still or 360 video and maybe just annotating it in what Premiere, I assume. Uh, yeah, you could do markup in Premiere. There's um, uh, if you're converting the file into uh, something a little bit more manageable that everybody can view as well, because not everybody knows how or what tools they may have on their uh, computers or phones to view a, sphere, a spherical image is um, you can flatten it out for those people and kind of give them at least a, a frame of reference 
Or you can just go, hey, download this iOS app. I'm going to Dropbox you or I'm going to email you the image. You can load it into the GoPro app or the Insta app or, you know, there's there's a ton of supported, uh, you know, tool sets out there that can, that can uh, view these images. It wouldn't be any other way uh, that you're not used to of, of looking at, you know, blocking out a scene or, you know, usually people sketch out on notepads or, or, or napkins. This is just a, another way to do the napkin sketch out, but for, you know, for, for VR, for 360. I think another hurdle for people getting into this initially is that, you know, if a customer of ours thinks, hey, I want to maybe try out some shooting some VR and goes to YouTube and searches VR video for like samples and what to look at. It's the Wild West. It varies widely in quality and there it's such a new technology. There isn't so much curation for it the way there is, you know, traditional video. Who do you think are some people doing it well? Uh, you know, in addition to your own work, where can people get inspiration? Yeah, I one, I guess, a piece of advice I would say is, um, you know, watch and try a lot of the experiences out. There's a lot of talented people out there that are working in in these mediums. Uh, Felix and Paul have been doing amazing work for years over their experiences. There's groups out there that are small production companies that are doing work for, you know, Nat Geo and Google. And um, sometimes they are the faceless wonders that make these awesome experiences. So going on, if you go to YouTube and you look at some of the the major ones like Red Bull uh, has been putting out great uh, live action VR content and they have a great um, AR experience to uh, to their rampage, uh, which was their m- downhill mountain bike event too. Their rampage app is a great example of a mixed technology and technical approach at shooting 2d using AR using LIDAR, you know, using a lot of these different methods that we've talked about in and putting it into an experience. If you have access to you know, an Oculus Quest or some of some other headset, uh, just trying different things and seeing what experiences work and what don't, because it is different. Some people do have uh, motion sickness, and that in part has to do with some of the technology has an effect on you in that way. The other one is just that some people there's the there's a disconnect that sometimes can happen for people where you know it may be like a virtual roller coaster. The frame rate may be off on the experience, which then creates some weird parallax effects, and that can mess with people's heads, and that's you know can lead to some of that motion sickness. Well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, I will ask you questions about Lil Wayne's skateboarding skills. He has gotten a lot better. If you have your own skate park, you're, you're going to get better. Hi, this is Ryan Hill, and welcome to another Employee Spotlight. Today, we're talking to Joshua Richardson. Josh, how's it going? It is going fantastic. How are you? I'm good. What do you do at Lens Rentals? Uh, so, these days, I'm mostly writing product pages. So, it, the text you see uh, on product pages, that was me, more than likely, especially on video products. Text and poor jokes. Yes. Uh, great jokes, in my opinion, personally. Uh, yeah. Agree to disagree on the jokes. Josh also, for trivia purposes, helped isolate the sound in our podcast studio. So if you're not hearing echo off the walls anymore, uh, write a nice email to Josh at Lens Journals. Uh, What did you do before you worked here? So uh, I used to work at a place that repaired tank trailers. So uh, the the trailers that you see delivering gas. Uh, It was a fun job for sure. Got to talk to truck drivers all day. Very lonely truck drivers. What got you into that? Uh, it was, it was a family thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like father, like son, (laughs) family business, I Uh guess. I don't know. And what's your, what's your video background? Um, so I started just casually doing photography just before, I guess, what's called the DSLR video boom. And then I just kind of naturally progressed into doing video, uh, mostly just for online video, YouTube stuff, uh, short sketches, stuff like that. Uh, eventually turned into a semi-popular YouTube channel uh, called Dudes in Space, uh, where I think we're sitting at around 16,000 subscribers. So. 
I have seen that. We'll 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 put a link to that in the show notes for sure. And uh, what do you use to shoot outside of work? Yeah, so I had two go-tos when I was doing a lot of online stuff, uh, mostly because it was portable and quick to use. A GH5S uh, is a favorite, of course. Uh, you can't get much better quality in a package that size, especially with, you know, even with audio on board, it was still a hand-holdable, uh, very small. And also C100 is a, a go-to for sure, um, just because you can take that uh, footage right out of the camera and throw it wherever you need to and just post it. And what lenses do you typically use with those? Uh, I like very wide lenses. So on the Canon, it would be, what, the 11 to 24, whatever that big yeah. wide zoom is. I really I like it. that 11 to 24. And then for Micro Four Thirds, the Olympus 8 to 14, maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's an 8 to 14. Something like that. It's been a minute since I used them. And you've done some live streaming too, is that right? Yeah. Um, Dudes in Space toward the end... Uh, we started streaming some of our cooking live. Uh, occasionally, I'll do a, a drum cover stream, something like that. I've tried to stream karaoke before. I've kind of thrown everything at the wall, see if anything sticks. Is that a technical problem or an interest problem? Uh, I can't seem to keep interest in any one thing for longer than about a month or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a big problem. What do you like to use to stream? I know that's like a that's a really common question from our customers is that people are getting into live streaming. Yeah, so me, I'm just using a, a Blackmagic video capture device and running HDMI straight into it mainly. I do use a Roland V1 HD switcher whenever I'm doing multicam stuff. Uh, that's something we run here, and it's a fantastic switcher, uh, especially for, I, th- I think it's $1,000 new. What do you think you would do if you didn't have to work at all? What What is your dream job? Hmm. In that case, I would probably write music, uh, write and record music, just put out albums casually. You have some band stuff on Spotify, right? Like some former music you've made? Yeah. I uh, wrote and recorded an album with a band called Castiel. It's like a progressive rock-ish on the radio side of progress- progressive rock, but it was fun. Uh, probably the thing creatively that I'm most proud of, uh, actually. It was a lot of work, like four years of work, but it paid off. All right. We will also link to that in the show notes. So take a look if you want to see Josh's stuff. Uh, again, this has been Josh Richardson. If you call in, you might talk to him on the phone. Yeah, that's true. Occasionally handles tech support calls. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming in. No problem at all. Back to the podcast. So getting back into the show now, um, again, we're here with Jim Godoldick, who is a VR cinematographer and creative technologist. Uh, is that a title you came up with yourself? I don't think I did. I think actually somebody somewhere did. It's kind of mixing, you know, the creative world with the technology because I'm a technical creative. Um, you know, I, I, I take a lot of, uh, of time to know the ins and outs of either the piece of software or or, or camera or technology that I'm using uh, to, to tell whatever story it is that I'm working on. And uh, getting into some more specifics about that, especially in regards to VR video, what are some of your go-to tools, uh, cameras, audio, what do you like to use? Um, I think from the camera side, you know, I'm pretty much camera agnostic, right tool for the right job and recent projects. It's been everything from tons of GoPro fusions to Insta360 Pro 2, and then building custom solutions, um, either building them with a team or putting rigs together myself or working with, uh, you know, any of the manufacturers or, uh, specialty suppliers working with the Michael, Mansuri at Radiant Images over the years. Um, Michael's uh, pushed quite a bit into some rigs and some solutions um, that you can't find off the shelf. Y- you kind of have to look at what you need. And then obviously working with you guys over over the years in terms of uh, how many times I've had to uh, put a shopping list together last minute and then you guys <laughs> being able to ship everything out. And uh, so I get it in time before I jump on a plane. It's always good to know that, you know, you do have multiple resources in terms of the camera solutions today. 
in terms of audio for ambisonics, a lot of tools out there are pretty specialized in some of the, you know, higher order audio for that. But you've got the Sennheiser Ambio, which has kind of been like the the go-to solution using basically an audio array. Uh, so using like a multi-track recorder, like an F8 or, or something that's similar to that, where you can have multiple inputs of different mics, uh, especially placed. So you would have a different uh, ambisonic order uh, to be able to capture. And then, you know, whichever audio house that you're working with or, or mixer, you'd be able to work with that audio um, in Pro Tools, in Logic. Um, so you'd be able to to work with the audio and post as well from these. The post-production process obviously is going to be a little bit different, even if you were to just approach it as working with multiple cameras. How do you put it all together? I mean, I know the deliverable is going to drive a lot of that, but for just kind of a broad project, if someone just wanted to put something together for broad delivery, uh, what would your post-production process be? Um, I'm going to make everybody very upset right now and say that is not a one-button solution. Like the evolving story of all of this is... You know, the technology is kind of figuring itself out as well. There are solutions and there are a bunch of them. Uh, So it comes back to that question of like, you know, what is your capture method? What is your delivery method? But today um, it's much different than it was even five years ago. It's much easier. Some of these cameras can stitch the 360 and the 180 on camera and be able to get to what is called an echo rectangular file, or at least in the proper format that you can bring it into either the camera manufacturer's software um, or some type of, of studio application that you can you can manipulate that. Obviously, Adobe has been knee deep in this for, for a number of years, and uh, they have solutions right built into the VR tool set within Premiere and within After Effects. So getting your stuff in and viewing it in editorial um, is much easier today. So you can shoot on a GoPro Fusion and stitch that in a number of tool sets, whether it be stitching it in Mystica VR, using you know the GoPro tools to stitch it and then export it out to get it over to Premiere or another editorial supported format, and then be able to do any of your grading, your visual effects, your titling, your reframing. You have choices, but I think tried and true, a lot of people have been leaning on Premiere from a editorial standpoint for for that because Adobe did jump on it earlier than some of the other editorial platforms versus Avid versus Final Cut or Lightworks. So, you know, going the Adobe method is is a pretty easy route these days if you're wanting to get your feet wet. So, looking at the the process is is um go out there, read the manuals, watch the YouTube videos, get some of the prep done ahead of time before you go shooting with this or going to post production. Because I've gotten those calls from people where like, hey, uh, we decided we were going to handle post ourselves. You shot all the content. We don't know how it works in Premiere or we don't know how to use Nuke or Mystica or they thought that they could have their in-house team do it. And, you know, this stuff is still, you know, pretty specialized in some areas of it. I'm not going to scare people and say that um, this is unobtainium, that you know, you can't figure it out. You sure can figure it out. You just have to, you have to put a little bit of time and, um, and know how into it because some of the workflows are, are still rooted in visual effects, heavy workflows. So you're stitching multiple plates together and then you're having to worry about color balancing and exposure across multiple sensors, which affects how you would shoot things on the day of. So your production and your pre-production or your pre is going to affect your post just as much as, you know, they can all have an effect on each other. Um, so it's, it's, it's really being good about planning is, is that's probably one of the best things you could do is just have a really good plan, both for production and and previs, and then for post-production, don't wait till the last minute to figure out the piece of software. Another thing is talking to your rental house, letting them test things for you in advance if you know very specific circumstances that you're going to be working under and you have concerns about how some of this gear might work. Um, I think a lot of people have this DIY mentality that they have to wait till they get it when there's a lot of vetting they can do in advance. Yeah. And the the method is sometimes they, you may not have the right equipment to 
do some of this stuff in the field, whether it be just even having, you know, uh, Wi-Fi access to download a firmware uh, patch or uh, to reflash firmware or roll it back. It, it happens, you know, it happens at the highest level where a camera goes down for whatever reason. And, you know, you have camera department trying to, you know, reflash firmware or set up another camera body. And I don't think sometimes people take the time to really learn their their systems, whether it be audio, whether it be a piece of software or or, or a camera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Getting back to some of the editorial uh, delivery formats vary really widely from service to service. So if you're exporting to finish on, say, Facebook, or if you're going straight to YouTube, often those services uh, will require different codecs. Uh, Oculus, Vive sometimes require different things. Do you see any of that changing in the future? Is one service or device going to become a standard, or is it going to remain disjointed, you think? Well, um, I think we have standards today. You know, a lot of the delivered um, live action content, nine times out of 10, it's it's in a it's in a codec or a wrapper that is already established. You know, H.264, H.265 is pretty common in compressed delivery format for video to these devices. You can also, I mean, you can also view 2D content. You can watch Netflix in a, in a VR headset. Um, they've got a theater mode. There's theater apps. You're consuming 2D content as much as you're consuming uh, 360 or 180, you know, VR or AR. And yeah, it's it's been a little bit of a Wild West, too, in some of the other delivery methods. But you're still having 3D assets. You're still having applications. I, I think where it gets a little bit trickier is if you're packaging a um, kind of a game-ready environment as an application. So if you're doing something in Unreal Engine or Unity, you're packaging that content and going off of the delivery methods to the platform from what is a game pipeline. And if you're delivering for iPhone, you've you've got the App Store delivery methods. So you have to do a little bit of research and it goes back to like, okay, what's my destination? If it's for mobile iOS for an AR or a VR uh, particular application, you got to take all your content and your story and get that all into a ecosystem that is going to be more of a traditional app delivery versus say just delivering to you know YouTube 360 or Facebook. Nowadays, we're having a lot of mixed environment where you may have part 360 video for live action if it's destined for some of the platforms. There's different avenues to get get your stuff onto the headsets. As a creator, there's also potential to get your your project, whether it be the end result, be an app, an experience, or even a video by working with Oculus or HTC or Facebook. They have artists and creator and developer grants for projects. So if you're if you're basically wanting to pitch them a project, you know, um Vive has a platform and development you know, I think each one of the major platforms at times does creator kind of residencies because they want content. That's a thing for for VR and AR and all the this new immersive and experiential um, mediums to survive. We we need content. We need good experiences on them. So I think you're seeing uh, a lot of the companies that are making the hardware. They want people to put good art and stories and. Uh, music and projects onto these platforms. So there is help to, you know, basically get some funding and get some know-how. So now that you've been on the forefront of this new era of creative technology for so long, do you think or ever wish that you could just go back to making skateboarding videos on VHS? No. Um, <laughs> I'm just, no, I think as, as somebody who is a creator, um, that there's still reasons why I'll go back and I'll shoot on film. You could shoot film for VR. Yeah, that's going to make your budget go up qu quite a bit. But and I think it's I think it's just it's a choice. It's a creative choice. It's an aesthetic choice. I think it's just like why, you know, uh, Nolan still chooses to shoot his major awesome films on on film. Uh, same thing for Tarantino. I definitely keep in my mind like 
what I have gone through over the years in a lot of different projects, both from, you know, the, the skate stuff through to, you know, the feature stuff. And it's just, it's just in a learning experience. You learn what works and what, what takes a lot of time. And that, that just informs and makes you have informed decisions about the next project, whether that's your passion project, whether you're getting hired as a small production company or as a, a DP or director or whatever your role is, you know, you're taking everything that you've learned in your career and bringing that to set on that day. Take more time as you're coming up, whether it be you're learning hardware and software or learning more about the business. I don't think people learn nearly enough about the business of creating as they should, just so they can make better decisions for themselves, for their family, for their, for their crew, um, and for their projects. Well, Jim, thanks so much for coming in. It's been great talking to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll link to everything we've referenced here in the show notes. So if you heard anything you want to check out, look at the link in the show notes and it'll be there. And Jim, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals Podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. I'll leave you with this quote by Werner Herzog. I would travel down to hell and wrestle a film away from the devil if it was necessary.